Do you want to build your online course but don't know how to get started? So if the answer is yes, then today's episode will help. Because my guest today is Rodney Dot. He recently created and launched an online course in just 28 days and he's going to walk us through the process of creating and building a course in public in just 28 days. My name is Matt Jaro and you're listening to Build Your Thing, the podcast where we help content creators find the unique creative voice, monetize their work and build their tribe of loyal fans. So with that being said, let's get started. All right, Rodney, welcome to Build Your Thing. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's it's a pleasure, Rodney. And for those who don't know you, could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, I'm Rodney Dow. I help, you know, people build atomic courses, which are small courses, atom-sized courses that help grow their influence and income. Awesome. Awesome. So can you give us a little bit more perspective behind like what do you understand or what do you actually mean by atomic courses? Yeah, atomic courses means you're giving them the smallest packet of value that you can, uh, that they could pay for. Of course, it could be free, but mostly I'm I'm focusing on that you would sell your work. And so that usually means you're you're creating something that somebody can get through in less than an hour. Awesome. And, and it when it comes covers a single a single topic, you and you'll a lot of sometimes if you have to break it into subtopics, maximum of three. Okay, perfect. So um what is like your your process when it comes to creating creating those atomic courses? When it comes to first obviously validating that this is a problem worth solving and well, like all the next step that that come after that that come after that. I do a bit differently than what some other people do where they try to do market research or something like that. Um what I say is one of the ways to go about it is to look at problems that you have solved either for yourself or for your clients. So if you don't have clients, what problems have you solved? You used to have a problem, you used to be a certain way, now you're not. How did you achieve that? And that's the trickiest part because people end up not valuing what they are already good at, what comes easily to them. And so it sometimes takes a little bit of coaching or, or a little bit of you know list making and putting it aside and coming back. But you want to find those things that you already know. You already know how to do that. You don't have to research how to do it because you're already good at it. And that's one way because that the fact that you had that problem, you're not alone. Other people have the problem too. And um, But if you want to validate it, the best thing to do is to make very short content about it, about what you did. So let's say, uh, let's give an example here. Um, you've solved the problem of how you get yourself up early in the morning and you used to struggle with it. Now you don't. Now you might think, well, by the time it's two years later, that's a deep habit and you're just getting up early in the morning every day and it's not a problem. You've thought that's not really an issue. <laughs> uh, it's for you forgot that it was a struggle for you, but you came up with some solution. If it didn't come easily to, if you had to try multiple times before you finally arrived at a solution, that means other people are also struggling with that as well. So figure out what you did. Now put it into a tweet, like a list tweet, where you just list bullet points. Here's how I get up early in the morning. See if anyone cares. If no one cares, well then, there you know. There you go. And also make sure you're tweeting multiple other things so you can compare. Because if you have a small account, uh, you say, oh, only I only got uh, you know 500 views on it or... 10 comments. Well, you don't have anything to compare it to unless you're tweeting about other things. So tweet about multiple topics, things that you've solved, problems you've solved in your life, and then see which ones take off the most. And that's how I would validate an idea. Um, And then you just expand a little further, um, write a tweet thread about the same idea. So you're going, you're expanding it a little more. Oh, okay. People like that tweet thread. You get a lot of good response. Okay. Now expand that into an art, uh, maybe, maybe an atomic essay, like off, we'll then expand that into, you know, a longer article. All right, you fully validated this idea now. And so go ahead and make your course. And by the way, if you get a huge response at any of those levels, sometimes intuitively, you might just say, no, I need to just pursue this thing. So I'm not saying you have to go through every step methodically, but definitely test ideas in small forms, uh, which will also help clarify because you'll also get questions, you'll get feedback, you'll get people saying, I don't understand what you're talking about. So you'll, you're going to get all sorts of back and forth feedback um, 
instead of just trying to figure it out all by your lonesome, you know, you know, deep in some cave somewhere where you just say, let me figure out this brilliant idea and, and deliver it to the world. Well, the world may not care or they may not understand it because you didn't have any dialogue with anybody. Yeah, that makes total sense. So like the first thing, which I find really interesting is actually um, being able to spot out the, the things that we've already solved in the past. Like um, this, I think is brilliant because we are so blind to the things that we are good at or we already solved. And then we just, you know, try to keep things complicated and try to perhaps come up with with a course or a product for things that, that we didn't really solve right now. And I really like this approach that really you should look back at the things that, that you solved. And the second thing is that um, by start creating this micro content, it doesn't have to be on Twitter. It could be, it could be any, anywhere else. Um, it first helps you also to really understand, okay, what, what kind of, what problem am I actually solving and, and how, how could I, could I solve it? And it, you know, like, really going through this thought process and, and start writing about it is already like the, the first step in, in order to create an, uh, in order to create a course, right? Exactly. And I love how you mentioned it doesn't have to be on Twitter because um, I get really great response on LinkedIn as well um, as Twitter, but somebody else could be doing things on TikTok. I don't know very much about TikTok, but, or YouTube could be your validation area because any place where there is an already pre-built audience, I think the worst place to do it is if you have a blog that you just started and you don't have any traffic source, obviously you can't validate anything. Um, there's one other validation method, uh, which, cause I, I work for a company and I do their marketing and build their courses. If you have a large email list, then shoot, just create a waiting list page and say, Hey, are you guys interested in this topic? Join this waiting list. If you already have a large audience that's there that you can do that with, because we would get hundreds of people saying, yeah, I want to get on the waiting list for this project. Then we could say, great, we're going to make it, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, uh, and if nobody responds to it, well, then you say, well, never mind. Obviously nobody cared even on our own email list, which is the very best audience you can get. If the best audience you can get doesn't care, you would have to find a completely different audience for your work. So, um, so yeah, so these, a lot of this advice is for people who don't have and uh, like a, an email list where they can validate because once you have that list, that's the easiest way to validate. Yeah, exactly. And one one other thing that um, certainly people you know could try is running ads. I mean, you can easily start you know running an ad with, let's say some some of your thoughts. So like depending on, I don't want to pitch any specific. There are platforms where you can you know just craft something and just test, test if people click, test if people, you know, just pull up a landing page and, and, and just see. Ferris did with his book, The 4-Hour Workweek. He ended up putting Google ads and testing different titles. And he had one title that he thought was really creative, which was how to, you know, sell drugs for fun and profit or something. He just thought that was a funny way to get across the idea. It completely bombed. <laughs> But then he just on a lark said, "Oh, what do we just what what about this four hour work week title?" And tested that, and it went crazy. Yeah, and it's because the it, you know you think about your testing method. If you're testing like titles, especially what happens on a on a Google ad or what happens on a tweet, it's a split second decision to look at it. And when I saw on Amazon there was this book four hour work week coming on, in a split second I added it to my waiting to my uh, read list or whatever. Um, because I just, the title really caught me, but if he, how would he know that that was the best title, you know, intuitively without any testing method? So yeah, having a way to test is a wonderful thing. Awesome. Awesome. And dot like th th this brings me now to the, to the core actually of, of the episode, to the core topic that we really wanted to talk about is that you build, um, a course in public and, could you walk us a little bit behind behind the scenes? So, first, how did you how did you come up with this idea? Well, um, I'm going to to build a to build a course in public. All right. So here's how I came up with the idea. I mean, I'd heard about build in public before, and I wasn't necessarily that interested in doing it all the time, to be honest. Um, but I wanted to build this course, so I, I 
I wanted to teach people how to create atomic courses. I want to create an atomic course, but I really felt like I wanted to demonstrate that this can work and that how quickly we can do this. And um, so I wanted to build the course uh, and say to everyone, look, see, I just built a course in the amount of time I said I could do it. Um, and in a small amount of time per day to do it, like I didn't spend two hours a day on this. I'd spend 15 minutes to up to 60 minutes a day. Uh, so there was a lot of 15 minute work periods. Um, and what I did is I said, well, I want to do this, but when I market stuff, I usually create free content to help market it. And I don't have time to create this course and create all the marketing content at the same time. So I thought, you know what, if I build in public, that'll do double duty. It will, um, it, I'll be building it, you know, and also, uh, it'll be marketing it because they'll be getting free content about what I'm building. So that's basically why I did it. And it turned out to have more benefits than what I expected, but that's that was the that was the why behind it. That's very interesting. So you really thought like, how could I leverage and get more out out of my efforts in, instead of you know having to create the course and then create other perhaps unrelated unrelated free content that actually needs you to you know to put yourself again in, into the into the mood of let's say creating like first the course and then you have to restart again and then just start creating your free stuff so you actually combined and and, and saved like 50 percent of mental bandwidth by just you know being focused on one thing and then just you know talking about okay like this is what i did today and this is how it how it went and at the same time it also helped really engage with With, with your audience so that they were seeing, okay, this guy is really working on something interesting. And now he's been talking about for 28 or 25 days. And, and it actually helps you also in, in launching the, 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 the course, right? Exactly. And it was beautiful in, in launching the course because now everyone's pre-sold on, on it because they've seen what it's about. Um, and there was another benefit though. And this was the benefit that I, I really should have thought of, but I didn't. And so, you know, when you have a project and it takes a while, uh, if it takes more than a few days, it's possible for your motivation to flag at some point and, and, and then you kind of stop working on it and you're, you're mm -hmm. not as excited anymore and, and all that happens to me. And so I don't always finish all the projects I start. Um, and there was a day where I was really beat and I was just really not feeling it. And I wrote about that and I got some work done anyway. And I also wrote that, hey, if it wasn't for you guys, you know, commenting and and uh, reading it, because I can see how many people are are viewing the updates every day, uh, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be here writing this portion of the course that I made today. And then people wrote back, oh yeah, you know, and and with with helpful, you know, supportive comments and things. So that helped me get through that. So I would say that motivation piece is really important because once you start. It's, you know, you, people fuck, talk about accountability. I'm one of those people who I'm not really that interested in, like, quote, accountability, like that, you know, just because I said I'm going to do it. Um, but people supporting me is super uh, motivating. Um, I mean, I do want to do things I say I'm going to do, but, uh, but you know, there are times when you can just tell people, oh, I, I didn't have time or whatever. But when they're supporting you and you've promised it to them, I feel like, oh, no, I need to fulfill my promise, you know, not so much accountability, but like, you know, keeping my promise to them that I that I would deliver this benefit to them. And also, hey, they really care. <laughs> they actually mm -hmm. care that I get this done. Whereas you're working all by yourself, you know, you can easily forget that somebody cares, you yeah. know, but when you post every day, it's impossible to forget. That, that, that makes perfect sense. So um, before, you know, You walking us um, through like what happened in in those 80, 28 days. Can you tell us a bit more about like what happened? So, how was your course launch, and how did you how did you manage um, all the all the elements? Like the the actual sale of the of the course. Yeah. So so Or... basically, like you went through creating your course during those. 28 days and then okay it was time to release it so how was mm -hmm. um what were the, the the results that did you got and how did you actually um how did you approach like the whole launching thing so did those 28 
days of you know daily emails help you? Obviously, they, they helped you in, in in selling the course. But um, did you add any other kind of promotion or like did you did you build any any other you know things around it in order to yeah, launch? Yeah. So so whenever I want to sell a program like that, it's this is something I want to have on sale all the time. So I'm not taking it off, right? So. Because if you do that, that's a great way to create you know, time scarcity. Hey, you can only get it during this time period. But I want it always available. So what I did is I created bonuses that were uh, time-limited bonuses. Now, the people on my list, they join my list because they want to build their own courses. Mm -hmm. So the bonuses I made were, they were things that I, I realized, oh, I should have like shown this to them. I, I wrote some updates where I said, I got this done, I got that done when I was tired and I just didn't have time to demonstrate it or, or teach it. So I actually made videos showing, here's how I made the Gumroad graphics. Here's how I made the graphics that go inside the course. Um, and uh, I made those the bonuses. And people were happy to get them because I, I made them on Loom so I could see how many people viewed <laughs> viewed those videos and looked like they all viewed them. So they, were, they actually were interested in those bonuses. Um, but yeah, so those bonuses expired. Um, and uh, so that's how I made sure to get... Um, people to buy right away. And so uh, the first day I didn't have the Gumroad notification set up on my phone. I didn't have that. So I didn't realize people had bought the course because um, the company I work for, we always give a specific time window and say, look, 10 a.m. it's going on sale. And so as soon as 10 a.m. hits, sales will start coming in. Uh, when I released it, it was, at six, I, it was my regular email time, which is 6 a.m. Uh, for this uh, newsletter. I didn't see sales come in for the first hour. And I said, okay. And then I just, um, then somebody asked me for a link to it. And so I went to retrieve it and I saw, oh, there's five sales now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was five sales on the first day. Second day, there was none. Third day, which was the last day, there were two sales. So there ended up being seven sales. And with the very tiny email list I have right now, which is, it, back then it was 180 people. Uh, I'm, it's a little bit more now, but I was pretty happy because that's like 5% of the email list or so. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so who bought it, or actually it's less than 5%. But anyhow, it's still, a, it was still pretty good. And it's not the topic, you know, it's on organizing your creative project. So it's not 100% what, what they're looking for as far as building, you know, building courses, even though it's very helpful in building courses. So I, I didn't, it, I didn't think it would be a super high seller anyway, but I was just glad I got it done. I, I, I was glad that I created a beautiful product. It is, it's, it's a very beautiful. When you look inside, you'll see, uh, uh, it looks really nice. So I was really proud of it, and um, was really happy to get um, get those sales and and have those people trust me to deliver them something. Awesome, awesome. So, so congrats on 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 this achievement. Actually, like you know, having having people, you know, almost five percent of your list buying a course is not directly related to what they actually signed up for because you mentioned that they they were interested in actually creating courses i think it's it's a pretty it's a pretty darn good uh, achievement so congrats on that thank you thank you you're welcome yeah so yeah it was it's a uh it was you know it's fun to create it and um and i i, I learned a lot in that process uh of creating it and it kind of got me back into the newsletter habit i mean i started my weekly newsletter like maybe a week or two before I started that that challenge and I wasn't sure what I was going to do every week <laughs> in the newsletter <laughs> but since the challenge is over I've been posting weekly you know newsletters so it's not been a problem <laughs> awesome awesome so in courses obviously like you have you have a kind of a of a time span after which you know talking about the course may seem a little bit you know um how can I say it's like ad fatigue, right? So like the more you're talking about something, the more people get used to it, the less they are going to, to be interested. So this is why let's say when, when I'm launching a product, usually it, it lasts between five to seven days after that. Like, I just think it's like, it's like too much. So what did you do to 28 days of constantly talking about the process of building it? No. Oh. Um, not everybody wants daily updates. <laughs> and so at the time, I didn't know how to do any kind of I didn't even know that was possible. Um, so there were people who signed up for weekly email who thought they were going to get weekly emails. And then they started getting daily ones. And I did a poll 
right before I started uh, saying, hey, do you guys want me to make put this in like another publication? And the 80% of them were like, no, just keep it here. So obviously the 20%, and by the way, hardly not, it was a tiny number of people who responded to the poll. Uh, the 20% who didn't, uh, you know, they didn't want that. So some of them unsubscribed. I, I, I had a bunch of unsubscribes. I had all these new subscriptions come in and all these unsubscribes come in. It was still a net gain, but um, you know, that happened. So, so that, that you were going to get that. Uh, but since then I found out that you can create sections in a Substack publication and have people only subscribe to one or the other or both and, or in as many subsections as you want in your um, Substack. So in the future, I'll be able to say, Hey, if you don't want any more of these daily updates, you can still get the publication, just unsubscribe only from the, the you know, the daily updates. So, um, so that's fine. But the thing that I did is so, uh, but to answer your question though, about like keeping it fresh, because it's progress, it's fresh automatically, because on day one, it's like, here, I'm laying out my plan. Okay, day two, I'm doing this part of the outline, here's the formula I'm using. Day three, here's the next part of the outline, here's the formula I'm using. Day four, right? So I end up having the entire outline. Then I say, okay, now here's my writing process. I have a bullet writing process for how you fill the outline before you do the real writing. So I bullet this mouth, you know, uh, these, this part. Now I'm bulleting this part. But, uh, and then I actually did different things. So uh, you're reminding me. So one of the things I did on some days is I made videos of me writing. And I would talk out loud. And people loved that. They were like, wow. <laughs> I, you know, I, I like to hear how you think, like how you think as you're writing uh, something, which I'll have to say is such a pain in the butt to, to make such a video because it really slows the writing down terribly. <laughs> so, but, um, but just do different things. And so I broke the course into three parts. When you do the first part, you go into detail on all these things you're doing. Then the second part, I didn't really feel like I'm going to show all the detail of how I did some of the stuff because I already showed that. It's just repeating it. So I would do different things like like writing out loud, you know, and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, you just vary it. You'll feel usually I caution people on on feeling like things are rep repetitive because there'll be people who I work with and they say, oh, I can't use all the same promotional materials I used last year. And I say, well, yes, yes, you can, because people don't remember all that stuff. Um, however, if you're doing something every single day, <laughs> there's much more chance of memory. <laughs> so so I did very, very things. When you do something um, once a year, the, though, don't, the, people don't remember. I've been using the same promotional materials for three years for one of the courses that I teach uh, at another company. And the promotion, the results have only gotten better with time, not worse. But uh, But that's once a year. So, you know, nobody remembers. And the people who do remember are usually pre-sold on the idea. So they, they don't really care if they, if they notice it's even if they notice it's the same content. So, yeah, I would I keep varying stuff. So you can do things like it doesn't always have to be text. It can sometimes be video. Some things are almost impossible to demonstrate in text or, or they're just too tedious. So do it in video. Um, you can do audio, too, because sometimes you just if you don't feel like writing, uh, Substack lets you do audio, or you can do just talking head video where you say, here's what I did on this project today. So you can vary it that way. Um, one of the things I did is I would take screenshots of outlines and screenshots of writing. So that those are all different things. I, uh, I didn't have like a system for varying things, but actually, now that you asked that question, I'm actually going to look back and look at what are the variety of things I did, and I can be more systematic about it in the future or if somebody if I want to teach a build in public course or something and I'll say okay so don't do the same thing every day <laughs> and here's the variety of things you can do that you can rotate yeah yeah that's that's awesome and, and especially you know like just to um to talk about you know like those, those feedback loops and when you're doing something every day like the feedback loop are just so fast that you can radically improve like from you know from 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 today let's say if you're doing something every day next week you'll be 10 times better set or seven times better right and this is like why um really you know having the mindset of being able to create all those small feedback loops actually help you in, improve um and 
in any in any kind of thing that you just want to get done, right? Just just do it every day, and you're going to see that you're going to make tremendous progress in just in just you know in just in just a few days. Yeah, and you know what that you, what you said reminded me of something else because you know when you do something every day, you get like fluency, like it gets easier. It, it you're, it's like your brain is oiled up. It's like a oil, well better oiled machine. Uh, and there's another thing though about making the updates. You end up reflecting on your work. And a lot of times we complete work, pieces of it, and we don't think about those pieces very much after we've made them. But when you are writing these daily updates, you end up reflecting, oh, here's what I learned from what I did today. And when I teach courses, cohort-based courses, I have them do work. We usually have them do work five days a week and reflect on it each day as it happens. People end up learning tremendously from those reflections, sometimes from even a five-minute activity. So... um, that's another benefit is you end up learning a lot more from the same level of effort. And so you're, there's more confidence because you're like, oh, I can repeat this. I get what I did. I understand how I broke this down. Whereas I remember there were times in the past where I would do something. For one of the first time I created um, an online program was back in 2005. And someone's like, oh, you should create another one. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Right. <laughs> now, if I had fully understood my process, I probably would have said, oh, of course I could do this again, you know? Uh, So I didn't, I I kind of felt like I was moving by the seat of my pants. Whereas after reflecting, it's like, oh, I've broken it down. I get, here's this principle that I use. Here's this technique I use. Here's how I got through this frustrating bit or this confusing bit. Exactly. I think that the reflection part is very important, especially, um, you know, to really understand like where your bottlenecks are. So, like w- one of the things that I use, it's like when I see that something is just hard, or I'm just not able to be consistent with it. Like I just ask myself, okay, like what what's happening, and what is the what is the exact thing that let's say I'm procrastinating on, or I just can't get done, right? Because this is the thing actually worth solving. It's it's probably more important than any other piece of of the puzzle because this is the thing that you can get done in one way or another, right? Exactly. And it's it, the thing that, you know, who really talks about this a lot is Ray Dalio. He wrote this book called Principles. The key is to realize that whatever you're experiencing is not a one-time event. Mm-hmm. So if you're feeling anxious about the next step, has this happened before? Yes. So that means whatever solution you come up with that helps you through that is probably also going to be useful in the future. And if you are unconsciously coping with those things and never detailing it out, then you don't, you may not even realize the tools you have. And there's a, one other benefit too, is that you now have discovered stuff you can teach <laughs> because mm-hmm. if you figure out how you solved all those problems when you created your program, now you can teach people, here's how to solve the problem. Let's say you're, you're creating something about programming and you know, you're figuring out, oh, I was really struggling with this bit today. You wrote that down, how you struggled, how you came through it. Well, when you teach another programmer, you can now say, look, here's how I solved that problem when I faced it. Um, Instead of just the content, it's all the psychological bit. Like, how did you overcome that psychology? Or you're confused about uh, something. How did you even identify the confusion? How did you diagnose the problem? Uh, Sometimes we solve the problems without ever mapping out how we came about the solution. And so, yeah, that daily reflection is useful and building in public pretty much makes you, uh, well, at least the way I did it, which I strongly suggest others do, if you're going to build in public, make sure you tell what you learned each day, not just what you did each day, because that, uh, people love hearing that actually, you, you get a lot of good responses when you say, hey, you know, I was struggling with this bit and here's how I got through it. And then sometimes people will give you even more advice. Here's how I do it. You know, <laughs> and I'll say, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so so you're just getting unsolicited advice. So that's uh, that that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, and sometimes that unsolicited advice can be insightful and useful. So you might, uh, you know, if you're into personal knowledge management, store some of it and see if you could end up using it one day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And like, I really like the fact that it's like really like the, the way you just uh, you you just talked about it. It's really kind of building some kind of. SOPs in, in public and then being able just to to repurpose them later down the road because like many creators I work with also they 
they don't have written SOPs, right? So, okay, I just have to create a blog post. Okay, I'm just going to create a blog post. But they don't have any kind of checklist. But when you are actually reflecting and and, and trying to teach this to, to someone else, you just have to come up with those steps, right? And like doing like doing this like by building it in public actually allows you to to not only first create like create the um in your case it was like creating the course second was actually being able to tease your list with the upcoming course and number three it's also like writing down procedures so it seems like you have done three things at the same time yeah you're you're exactly right um yeah, you're you're exactly right. You you end up uh, recording the procedure uh, and and any psychological coping mechanism that you come up with, which is again another procedure. So yeah, you're you're exactly right. And it, it's funny because some of that stuff I I hadn't realized until we talked. I end up writing a, a piece called Nine um, Lessons I Learned from Building in Public, and I don't I'm not even sure if that's one uh, one of them. The the whole uh, procedure piece or how I overcame obstacles. It might be in there. I don't know, but I'll have to double check. <laughs> I might have if to reread like, my own updates to see what I, <laughs> what I included. <laughs> if not, just add like a, a point number 10 and just give me credit. I'm okay. I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll say, Hey, after this, well, actually, you know what I'll do is when um, your podcast comes out, I'll write a note and I'll say, Hey, I learned some things uh, <laughs> that I didn't even <laughs> share with you guys yet. So you should definitely listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome, great, great. So, um, right now, let's just talk about the product itself. So, your product is like, I'm not going to spoil it. Please talk about it. Yeah, so uh, it's called iPara, and it's basically how do you you know organize your your digital projects and your your digital life so that you can get more things done. And uh, one of the problems people have, and that I had, is my stuff would be scattered all over the place. And so, you know, where is it? Where is the stuff for this course I'm building? Where's the stuff for that course? Where's the stuff for projects that I don't have time to do right now, but I just had an idea about it. Where does it go? How am I going to find it when I need it? And uh, I had no approach to that. And I, I had tried many, I had tried multiple strategies for it. And I tried multiple tools. And uh, it was only after reading a couple of Medium articles about this PARA system that uh, Tiago Forte came up with that I finally started to get a handle on it. And then I said, I got to take this guy's course. He's offering a course. The second time, first, this is the thing about ideas. You give people ideas doesn't mean they apply it. First time I heard about PAR, I said, that's interesting. Second time I heard about it, I said, I need to do this. So I did it on my own. I just went and did it on my computer um, and organized my stuff that way and started to figure out how to organize other things that way. Uh, and then I said, you know, I got to learn more. So I looked him up and I I took his course um, and that this IPARA is basically what I wish I knew about this organizing system when I uh, got started with it. I, you know, I had it in place, but I didn't know like how to maintain it. I didn't know like how do you work with projects in it? Um, I didn't. So I had it. I had what I had at first was just something pretty. <laughs> and so I want to show you how to make it not just something pretty, but you know, where you feel that there's a sense of relaxation and relief once all that mess, when you know, when I had dozens of things on my desktop, when all that mess is gone, it feels good. But we want to go beyond just the feel good to okay, now we can use it. It actually helps you get things done. So that's what the the course is about. And each of the letters in Paris stands for um a, a part of the system. So you got a folder for projects, a folder for areas, a folder for resources, and a folder for archives. And um, everything in your digital life will fit into one of those four uh, four folders. Without exception, you can fit them all. And then I call it iPara because there is one other folder, which is Inbox. Um, but the Inbox is not always a folder. Sometimes it's a place. So um, your downloads folder might be an Inbox for you or your... Um, your desktop on your computer might be an inbox. You need to clear those out and sort them into one of those PARA folders. Um, but that's, so that's basically, <laughs> that's basically what it is. And uh, I teach it to all my clients. Uh, the, one of the reasons I wanted to make it is I teach it to all my clients and it dramatically improves their effectiveness. I've had many clients who we would get on calls and we would spend a few minutes me helping them find stuff in their computer. 
like that we talked about last week and they worked on it, but they can't find it. <laughs> and um, at one of my clients, I said, can, can you just share from your desktop? Because I'm just trying to understand why you can't find it. You know, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I just not understand it. And I saw so many icons that the icons were on top of icons. So there's no way to even visually scan what you're looking for. And I literally helped him clean that up in five minutes. <laughs> um, and it sounds miraculous. But what I told him is, here's the, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you the solution. It's a really easy solution. We set up the power folders and I said, so here's the thing. You could sort through each one of these things, figure out where it goes and it'll take you hours. But let me ask you this. Isn't this place kind of a dumping ground where you don't know where any of it is and the only way you can find it is through search, right? Through like the search in your computer. He's like, yeah. So this is basically an archive. So let's just dump every single thing into the archive. And I learned that from Tiago Forte because that's what he used to do with when he was in the, um, he used to work, he was one of the geniuses at the, uh, the Apple store. And I was like, yeah, this is what we need to do. We need to dump it all into archive. So we did that. Now from then on, as he accumulated things, we put them where they need to go. Um, but uh, it, it, it helps so much with just having control of your digital information where you feel like you can get things done. So that's basically what the course teaches. And that's just one story from the course. Awesome. Awesome. So like, I totally agree with you. Like, um, even let's say when I work with clients, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So when they share the screen, it's like you have like so many icons and then so many things and like notifications, like, like, and I think many people really don't understand, or I think that they don't get, um, they don't really understand like the, the problem with, you know, having, having such a cluttered workspace, right? So, um, when it comes to their browser, they have 500 different extensions. They have things all over the place, blinking, you know, di different things that pop up and all that kind of stuff. And, and what you really don't, don't, don't understand is like, um, even they may not notice, but your brain is actually processing all this information. And, you know, then you just have to ignore things. And then you just have to try to, to know, like when you're just looking for something, like how much, how much time are you actually wasting in, in finding that specific file that you want to work on? How many times are you, you know, searching through your note taking apps when it comes to retrieving this or that specific note? So like, for someone who really wants to be productive and, and really effective, um, it's all about, you know, um, really focusing on being able to narrow your focus on a new mental bandwidth towards the creation process. It's not about, you know, trying to, to you know, to sift through all this, all this mess, right? Yep, exactly. And um, the reason people have a mess is because they don't have a system or they try to come up with systems, but they don't have like a meta system that lets them know how they would organize any new thing that comes up. So for example, I had kind of a system in my Google drive, which, which I have two Google drives, one for work and one for personal. And I would say, Oh, I need to have all these documents related to a project in one folder. Okay. That's great. But then I had all these folders, long lists of folders. <laughs> And well, how do I find it? Well, I would search for it, of course. That's the only way I could find it. Then there wasn't any signal that let me say, here's the top three projects. Whereas in Para, in your projects folder, you're only going to have projects that you are currently working on. And that when you look, when you go in there, your brain goes, oh, that's a project I need to work on. And you don't have a hundred projects in there. <laughs> I mean, you, you probably aren't going to make much progress on them. So you have to keep a limited number in there. And that helps you focus. Um, you, and yeah, you can have more projects than, you know, than just like three or four, but, but you, it helps you focus just seeing that. And then when a project is over, you can move it to where it needs to go. Maybe it needs to go into archive because now we don't need that stuff anymore. We don't want to throw it away because we might need some stuff in the future. Or maybe some of that stuff that's in the project folder should go into a resource folder for information on a specific topic. And anyone listening, you know, I haven't explained, you know, what all these um, mean or like how, you know, what the, the actual definition of them. So I should probably do that. <laughs> Otherwise, as I just describe it, people are going to be like, what's he talking about? So, um, so project means it has a beginning and an end. So anything that has an end 
is a project. So if you are uh, buying a Christmas gift for somebody, that's a project. It starts and it ends. You're figuring out, maybe you brainstorm some ideas, maybe you go to some stores, but at some point the project ends. Creating a book, that's a project. Even writing a tweet is kind of a mini project, but usually we're talking about things that take multiple steps. So maybe a tweet thread would be more appropriate or an article. It has a beginning and an end. Areas are things that are always going to be part of your life or or very durable in your life. They don't end. So if you uh, have a significant other, uh, that's an area. <laughs> if you want to stay married to them or stay in a relationship with them, that's an area. You want to that, you know, so uh, or you have kids like I have kids. That's an area. My kids school stuff that has, is an area because schools, even though school will one day end, ultimately, it's not ending. It's not a thing that ends really for a long time. They might not end until they're in college. So that's really not a project. It's an area. Um, you know, um, meals. If you do something with planning meals, that's an area you can always keep planning them. A specific meal, like making something for Thanksgiving, making Thanksgiving dinner, that would be a project, but you overall have to eat every day is an, an area. And then we have resources. That's where information goes that you don't have to act on all the time, but it's useful to have. You might need it for something. Um, a lot of times information uh, related to hobbies or interests goes in resources. Um, if you're like a copywriter, um, a swipe file would go in resources. It's not something you're, you know, it's not a project, it's not an area, but it's, you know, you're going to keep coming back to that. Uh, sometimes checklists and things might go in there, depending on what, what they are. So that's stuff that you, um, that you use to help you, but it's not, it's not related to something that's going to end like a project and it's not an area uh, of your life that's one of those key areas that's really important and then the last thing is archive and that's just where you put stuff when you're done with it you know you put stuff that is um resources no longer relevant like oh i used to be interested in this topic and i'm not i move it from resources to archive uh areas that are no longer active maybe you have your kids school stuff and one day they go to college and they're no longer in college you don't need that school folder anymore that goes into inactive areas and then completed or inactive projects. Projects will end and you don't need them in your project list anymore and you may put them in archive. So that's a basic uh, overview for anyone who, awesome. who needs to hear that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rodney. Like it was a pleasure talking to you and really, you know, helping us really understand like how you, how you put together the course and how you actually build in public too. So before we wrap up this call, is there anything that you want to add? Yeah, um, I will say that um, if you have a, a pro this is one of the things I tell everyone, the smallest step you can take in a project, and it seems like almost inconsequential to a lot of people, you don't need to even have to have the whole PARA system to do it. If you have a project you're thinking of doing one day, make a folder named after that project, put one note inside of it, whether it's a word processing document or it's a note from Evernote or however, you know, Google Drive, however you're storing information, that's the beginning. Just like, here's why I'm interested in that project or here's what I think this project's going to turn out. Just put something in there, just get started with that little step. And then from there, you know, who knows what happens. You may start, your brain will start noticing things and you keep throwing them into that folder. <laughs> so that's the last thing I would say. So I know there's creators out there listening to this who have projects that they're thinking of doing one day. Just do that step with at least one of your projects so you can see the magic of it. Thank you very much, Rodney, for sharing your your journey with us. And well, talk soon. All right. Thank you. I was glad to be here. All right. So hope that you've enjoyed this episode with Rodney. And you'll find all the links in the description. And especially if you want to take your productivity to the next level and get more done as a content creator, be sure to check out my daily emails. You can get them for free. Again, the link in the description. Thank you very much for tuning in today. And I see you next week.